Hey everybody, welcome to Adventure Christian Church at Home. Uh, we know that this looks a little bit different this week, but we are so glad that you are joining us. Uh, we're continuing in our Grace Anatomy series this week. Before we get going, uh, Matt is going to lead us in some worship. Hey everybody, welcome uh, to worship. We are glad that you've uh, tuned in through the magic of the internet. We are going to spend this morning together, uh, worshiping together as best we can, being together as close as we can, uh, and, and making the best of this time together. Hopefully you've had some intentional time with your family, uh, some extra time with your kids maybe, and, and made the most of that. Uh, we believe that God is always at work around us all the time. Even now, he's using this uh, experience to grow us as a people and bring us closer to him. So make sure you're taking advantage of, of the opportunities that you have. That said, uh, we're going to worship together a little bit, and uh, I'm going to pray for us and get us going. So uh, if you would pray with me. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to worship together. Lord, help us not to make light of, uh, of these opportunities or to miss them, take them for granted, or to be overly annoyed by in the inconveniences that we experience. Uh, Lord, but instead... Lead us through this. Uh, allow us to uh, see your hand at work around us. And Lord, give us the courage and the strength to be a part of that. We love you. Thank you in advance for the opportunity we have to worship today, today Lord. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. You called me out of the grave. You called me into the light. You called my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. Back to life. Hear the song awaken. All creation singing. We're alive. Cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave. You call me into the light. You call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. Shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down. Shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found. Death can't hold us down. Shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Okay, so we're getting ready to go into a time of communion. And here's what communion is. If you've never done this before, uh, Jesus, when the night before he was arrested and betrayed and eventually executed, 
he got his small group together, right? He got his group of guys together, his closest friends together, and he said, hey, listen, here's the deal. Here's what's getting ready to happen. My body is gonna be broken for you and my blood is gonna be poured out for you. And when that happens, it's gonna establish a new deal, right? You don't have to go through, and this new deal means you don't have to go through a priest anymore. You don't have to do all these religious things anymore. You'll have access to my father, right? The access to my father, to be in a relationship with my father will be wide open. Why? Because my broken body and my, my, my blood will pay for that and it's gonna make that possible. But he says one thing, he says, every time you get together, don't forget, right? He says, do this in remembrance of me, which literally translates, don't forget what I've done for you. And so what we do every week in our church is we take this thing called communion. We remember this, this moment that Jesus had with this small group, this moment that Jesus had when he laid all this stuff out for us. And what we do, just like he did back in the day, is we take a piece of bread or a cracker or whatever you may have in your home right now. It could be uh, saltines, it could be a piece of bread, it can be, I don't know, like Cool Ranch Doritos. It's whatever you got in your house right now that you're gonna make that represent the body of Jesus that was broken for you. And then he took a, a cup and, of, of juice and like, like we, what we do is we take a cup of juice and we say, look, this represents the, the blood of Jesus uh, that was poured out for us. So again, whatever you've got in your home right now, it can be water, it can be orange juice, it can be Diet Mountain Dew, it can be a rock star energy drink. I don't know what you've got in your house, cup of coffee, uh, but that's gonna represent the, the blood of Jesus. And so what's gonna happen is the band's gonna play a song and any time over this next song that you're about to watch, you're gonna take that, that, that cracker or whatever it is, that piece of bread, and you're just gonna say, hey Jesus, thanks for, thanks for giving up your body for us. And you're gonna take that juice or whatever it may be, and you're gonna say, Jesus, thank you for, for shedding your blood for us. And you're gonna eat that cracker and drink that juice and just pray and just say, hey, look, Jesus, thanks. Thanks for doing this for us. Thanks for making this relationship with God possible. And so the band's gonna play. I'm gonna pray for us. The band's gonna play. And then any time in that song, uh, you can take communion. Jesus, you're good. Again, Father, this morning, we just say thanks for loving us. Uh, thanks for making it possible uh, for us to be in this relationship with you. Uh, Lord, as we take this communion, Lord, as we take that, that cracker and we drink that juice, uh, Jesus, our prayer is just this, thank you. Thank you for making it possible for us to be in a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Thanks for paying the price for us. Thanks for, for spilling your blood and allowing your body to be broken so that ours don't have to be. Jesus, we love you. Let me pray. Amen. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me there was another in the water holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. My dead left for death beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. But should I ever need reminding what power set me free? There is a grave that holds no body. Now that power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Oh. 
There is another in the fire. Oh, oh. there is another in the fire. Oh, oh. there is another in the fire. Oh, oh. and I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens. As the space between where's thin, I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us, nothing stands between us. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all these things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seeds And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I've count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be And I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him i can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's thin i can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between us there'll be another in the fire standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be We exist here at Adventure Christian Church to create a safe place uh, where you can come as you are while you are becoming all that God has called you to be. We're getting ready to go into a time of worship through giving. We operate here at Adventure out of the generosity of people that give. Uh, we believe that that is a form of worship and it allows us to take care of people in our church, in our community, and even abroad. There's three ways that you can give here at Adventure. You can give on our website by going to adventureky.org give. You can mail a check or you could give through our app. A couple of months ago, you probably remember our Give 10 Challenge. Now, some of you all probably have those $10 bills uh, still in your pockets or on your counter at home. And we're encouraging you in the next couple of weeks to consider giving your 10 to some of the local businesses um, in the area. If you go grab a cup of coffee, if you order takeout, we're encouraging you to use your Give 10 in that capacity. We are also launching this week our encouragement to you to call 10. This is uh, where we're asking you to consider 10 people in your life, people that don't even go to adventure, and give them a call. Check in with them, see how they're doing, uh, see if they have any needs. You can submit any needs through our website on our uh, COVID-19 response form. Um, but just check on your neighbors, check on people in your lives, and see how they're doing. So if you would like to give each other an air high five or the COVID toe tap, we're getting ready to hear from Brad and get our morning going. Hey, what's up, Adventure family? Today we are entering into the home stretch of our series called Grace Anatomy. And over the past four weeks, what we've been doing is we've been peeling back the layers of this thing called grace because, you know, if we're being honest, grace is a, it's a churchy word, right? It's a churchy concept. And if you've been in church for a while, then this thing called grace, like you've heard about it or you've heard someone preach about it or you've heard someone talk about it. But here's the thing, what I've found at least is when we're asked about it, 
we're not really sure how to, how to answer. We find out pretty quick that we're not sure what grace is or what it does or how it works or who it's for. It's just kind of there, right? We've got this surface level understanding of what grace is and what's it about. And if you're new to the whole church thing, you might be wondering like, what is grace? And, and why do people that believe in Jesus talk about grace so much? And, and as we've been talking about this, we've said, look, grace is, it's a lot like our hearts, right? And so we've got this thing that beats in the center of our chest, right? And our hearts, are a critical and vital part of who we are. With our hearts, we live. Without our hearts, we die. And yet, despite how important our hearts are to our lives, we don't think about them that much, right? We don't pay too much attention to this thing. And odds are, unless you have a heart condition, you haven't thought much about this thing that's beating in your chest even this morning. And so we don't have to remind this thing to beat. It just does. We don't have to think about making it beat. It just does. And yet this thing right here, our hearts, is what pumps and pushes life into our bodies. We need this. It is critical. It is vital to our lives. And grace is the same way. Grace works the same way. Like where grace, where, or rather where the heart pumps and pushes life into our bodies, grace pushes life into our souls, right? Where with grace, we live spiritually. Without grace, we die spiritually. It is critical. We need it. It's a matter of spiritual life and death. But, but like our hearts, we don't spend too much time paying attention to grace. It's just kind of there. And here's the deal. In the lead up to Easter, which is going to be happening here in a few weeks, whether we're in this building or not, we're still going to celebrate Easter together. And in the lead up to Easter, we felt like it was a good idea to kind of get below the surface and, and really learn and understand the real meaning of grace. What's it all about? So here's what I want to do. I know we've got people joining us from, from outside our church family this morning. And, and what I want to do is just a quick flyby so that if you're just joining in, you kind of know where we've been and, and also can know where we're going. See, the first week of the series, we asked the most fundamental question, and that was this, what is grace? Like, what is this thing called grace, right? We got to start somewhere, and that's the best question to start with in this case. And here's the answer. For you and I, grace is receiving what we need instead of what we deserve. Now, let me unpack this a little bit, right? We need grace, but we don't deserve grace. Well, why don't we deserve it? That might be what you're thinking. Why don't we deserve grace? Well, here's why. Because of sin, right? Sin is spiritual heart disease. It is the spiritual equivalent of physical heart disease. And, and here's what sin is, and here's when it happens. Sin happens every time we look at God and we say, look, God, I know that you thought this whole life thing up, and, and I know that you've got this way of living and how to do life, uh, but here's the deal, God. I think I can do life better than you. And so why don't you just get out of my way and, and let me do the things that I want to do, right? Why don't you just get out of my life and let me have what I want and do what I want? That's called sin. And sin kills the soul, right? And we've all, every single one of us, we've been given this terminal diagnosis because of sin. So, so the question is this, how do we fix it? How do we fix this terminal diagnosis? How do we right the ship? How do we make this thing work? Well, here's the truth. You can't. You and I, we don't have what it takes to fix our own spiritual dilemma, but God can and God does and God did, right? He has what it takes. He sent his son Jesus, right, to take what we deserve, which is death, so that we can have what we need, which is life, and that's called grace. That's what grace is, receiving what we need instead of what we deserve. Now, the next question we asked in light of this was, okay, now that I know that I need it and I don't deserve it, how do I get it? How do I get grace? And here's the answer to that question. You can't get it. You can only receive it. Why? Because grace is given, not earned. Grace is given to us, not earned. In our performance-based culture, it's hard to imagine receiving something simply based on who we are instead of what we can do or what we've done, right? That's, that's typically how life works for us. We don't receive things based on who we are. We receive things based on what we've done. We get the promotion, we get the raise, we get the whatever, we get the scholarship. Why? Because we earned it. We got it. We worked hard for it. In this case, that's not how it works. God works different. He says, I'm giving you this and there's nothing you can do to get it. You can't earn this. You can't be smart enough, pretty enough, fast enough, whatever it may be, rich enough, successful enough. If you want grace, the only way to get grace is through faith. Well, what's that? What's faith? Faith is this, it's believing and trusting that God is who he says he is and that he can do everything that he promised even when it doesn't feel true or seem possible. And here's the thing, I get that. 
There are days for me, I'm just being honest, there are days for me when it feels like, it feels impossible that someone could simply love me for who I am. That doesn't seem possible. That doesn't feel true. You know, I come from a performance-driven past. The men in my family, and this was handed down from generation to generation to generation, like we were told the mantra, the thing that we chased after was, you got to earn it if you want it, right? So I come from a performance-driven past, and I get what it feels like to work and earn and grind to get where I want to go. And it doesn't feel true, and it doesn't seem possible that I could be loved for who I am instead of what I can do. Who does that? Who works like that? God does. And his answer to that is faith. And here's what faith looks like, and here's what it sounds like in our lives. God, I can't, but I know you can. And so I trust you. And that's how we receive grace. And last week we asked this question, right? What does grace do? Again, here's the answer to this question. Grace gives us new life and a new way to live. It's two things, right? It gives us new life and a new way to live. And here's a big truth, church. Here's something we talked about last week. Grace doesn't make sin safe. Now we got to understand that because it's not just new life, but it's also a new way to live. Uh, See, a lot of the time, I think what we do is we settle for this cheap knockoff version of grace that says that I can do whatever with whoever, whenever, and all I have to do the next day is just say, hey, God, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Will you wipe this thing out? That's, that's really not what this thing does, and that's not really how it works. That's a cheap knockoff version of the real thing. See, see, here's what God did. God made sure that the spiritual consequences of sin were dealt with forever because of what his son Jesus did, right? When Jesus died on a cross and was shoved in a tomb and three days later walked out alive, right? That took care of the spiritual consequences that, that come with sin, right? But, but the real-time consequences of sin in our lives, those things still affect us. We still have to deal with this. And so if we stepped into a new way of life or a new life, then why would we want to mess with the thing that we left behind? Why would we want to mess with an old way of living that was full of sin, right? It's like, it's like playing hot potato with a hand grenade. It's just a matter of time before the thing blows up and and takes you and the other people around you with it, right? Because here's the thing, when sin blows up, when our lives blow up, they have a blast radius and it doesn't just affect us, it affects the people around us. And so when we receive grace, what we do is we put to death the old way of living. And because of grace, we step into a new life and a new way of living. And so what that does is that brings us up to today. And here's the question for today. So if grace leads us to a new life and a new way of living, here's our question. What's the new way to live? What is this, what is this new way to live look like? How is it different from the old way of life? If you got your Bibles in front of you or you got your Bible app on a separate device this morning, uh, go ahead and open up to Romans chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 1. Here's what it says. It says, so, so, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has set you free, has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death, right? Again, going back to you, there's this old way and now there's this new way. It says the the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. And what that means is no matter how hard we tried, we just couldn't ever get it right. We couldn't live up to this standard perfectly. So it says God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies that we have. And in that body, in the body of his son, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this, right? He closes this section out. He said he did this so that the just requirement of the law would be totally satisfied for us who no longer follow, again, the old way, no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Okay, so there's, there's a ton going on in these few verses. But, but right off the bat, Paul wants to make sure that we all get this point, right? That there is no condemnation for people that belong to Jesus. See, a while ago, we, we did this series called High Five, right? Where we talked about our values, our priorities here at this church. And in one of our High Five conversations, we talked about the fact that Jesus, he stands in between us and the people that want to condemn us or bring condemnation onto us. And he says to them that if you want to get to them, people that want to condemn, condemnation, if you want to get to my people, you got to go through me. 
And I love that about Jesus. And in Jesus' biographies, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see Jesus come to the rescue of hurting and broken people who are being oppressed and, and accused by people who thought they were better than them because they were more religious. But in this case, Paul isn't saying that Jesus is just doing this kind of getting in between us and condemnation as like a one-off here and there. Paul says, look, Jesus is doing this now for everyone. And here's why. Here's why Jesus stands between us and condemnation and says, if you want to get to them, you got to go through me to declare the end of sin's control over us. Now, this whole control thing, I'm just going to warn you, it's going to be a theme for today, right? So just buckle in. Every time you see the word control going forward, you're going to want to highlight, circle, underline that, and just kind of understand this is going to be a theme today. But here's the deal. Jesus, he sets us free from this terminal diagnosis of sin so that, like it says here in verse 4, we no longer have to follow, right, be controlled by, be led by our sin nature, right? That instinct that says to, to hop outside the guardrails, to, do, to look at God and say, get out of my life. We no longer have to le be led by or follow or be controlled by that. But instead, we can step into a new way of living, which follows the Spirit. So here's our answer. Here's our answer to, the, to today's question. What's the new way to live? The new way to live is a life that surrenders to, that follows, that's led by, and that's lived in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Here's what Paul says. He keeps going in Romans 8, verse 5. He says, those who are dominated by their sinful nature, they think about sinful things. But people who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, see, there's that word again, controlled by the Holy Spirit, think about the things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature, he says, is always hostile to God. They're always at odds. They're always squaring up with one another. Our sinful nature, it says, never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. You want to know how to make God angry, or you want to know how to make God, never make God happy? Just continue to push him out of your life, right? That's, that's, that's really how, what, what Paul is saying here. The people who continue to push God out of their lives and say, listen, God, I can do this better than you. Why don't you stay out of my life? They're never going to please him because what pleases God is being close to us, not being pushed away by us. But, but here's the deal. I know some of us, we're reading this and we go, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. I know you said we were going to talk about control. I don't want to talk about control. I know you said that was going to be a theme. I don't want to talk about control. And I know some of us are thinking this right now. No one controls me but me. No one tells me what to do. No one tells me how to live my life. And all of my control freaks right now that you're tuning in, your anxiety just went through the roof. And here's the thing. I get it. Me too, right? I, I, it's my, I, I feel the same way. Nobody controls me but me. Nobody tells me what to do. Nobody tells me how to live my life. Nobody's going to control me. Control is a hard thing for some of us to surrender, especially when it comes to our lives. You want me to surrender my life? You want, to, you want me to be controlled by something other than me? Yeah. Short answer, yes. But think about it this way. Uh, if, you, if you've been a part of the Adventure family, you know this story. Back in October, the end of October, right before my family and I, we joined this church, uh, we were on our way back from California. We had gone out to California to visit some of our friends that planted a church uh, in San Luis Obispo. Uh, shout out to Slow City Church, who's doing the same thing we're doing this morning. But we had gone out to visit some of our friends out in, in San Luis Obispo, and we had flown back. And in the process of, of being out in California, I got super sick, right? And, and so I'm flying in late at night into Cincinnati and then had to get in my car, or get in our Jeep and drive home. And I'm not feeling well. The thing that I want to do in that moment is I don't want to unload the car. I don't want to spend more time, any more time awake than I have to. I just want to crawl in bed. And so we, we pull my Jeep in the driveway. I pull around and, and open up the back of the Jeep. I drag the luggage out. I head into the house. I immediately get into bed. And at about 2 o'clock that morning, uh, I, get, I get woken up by a couple police officers at our door. And I look down the street. I look down the driveway. And my Jeep, which I forgot to put in gear, it's a stick shift, left it in neutral, had rolled down our driveway and into the front of our neighbor's house. Right, which is one of those like, ah, oh, how did this happen? And, and now something that was you know, already a pretty rough situation. I just wanted to go to bed. I just wanted to sleep because I wasn't feeling well. Now has gotten worse. My, my Jeep is, is in the front of 
my neighbor's house. And, and this is why I tell the story. We think about control. With nobody in control of my Jeep, with nobody behind the wheel, my Jeep was dangerous, right? It was a runaway vehicle. Uh, and it might as well have been a homing missile right to the, to, the, to the front of my neighbor's house. It was out of control. There was no one controlling that. And, and we're lucky, right? We're lucky that the only thing that needed to be repaired was the front end of my Jeep and the, the brick on the front of my neighbor's house. But here's the deal. It's not just about having someone behind the wheel because you go out to your garage right now and you look at your car and this car is a fantastic machine, whether it's a, whether it's a new fancy car or not. You think about all the hundreds of thousands of parts that, that have to work together to make this thing go and it's big and it's powerful and, and you know here's here's the thing it needs someone behind the wheel if it's going to be able to fulfill its purpose right so it needs someone behind the wheel we need someone in control of this thing if it's going to really fulfill its purpose but it's not just about having someone behind the wheel it's about having the right person behind the wheel because if you put jack my almost eight-year-old behind the wheel of my Jeep, it would be just as dangerous as my out-of-control Jeep running down my driveway right into my neighbor's house. If you put my, my, my cash, my five-year-old behind the wheel of my Jeep, now my Jeep is a weapon of mass destruction and no one is safe, right? You can see where I'm going with this. Some of us, we think, what it, we think that we have what it takes to get behind the wheel of our lives and white knuckle the wheel and we say, there's no way I'm letting go. I can do this. I can steer my way. I can navigate my way. I can make my way, my own way through my own life. And if that's you, can I just ask you an honest question today? How's that working out for you? How's that working out for you? I mean, really? See, I look at the statistics in our society right now when it comes to things like depression and loneliness and anxiety, and divorce, and stress. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And I'm just going to go out on a limb and say this. When it comes to being in control of our own lives, being behind the wheel, my guess is, if you were to answer this question honestly, when I say, how's it working out for you? If you're going to tell me the truth, you would say this, I'm worn out. I'm tired. I'm tired of trying to figure out how to keep all the plates spinning. I'm trying to figure out, I'm, t- I'm tired of trying to figure out how to, keep, how to keep juggling all of this stuff and keeping it all up in the air where it's supposed to be. Life is just too much to handle, and I'm right there with you. I mean, this week I had to figure out how, how to take a, an analog church and make it a digital church, right? And, and this Wednesday, I'll be honest with you, I hit a wall. It just became too much. Uh, the thought, you know, and having to figure all this stuff out and, and, and things aren't working. Facebook isn't working the way that it's supposed to. And I can't figure X, Y, and Z out. And I just, I finally just had to put my head on my desk and go, it's too much. Life sometimes can be too much to handle. And, and if we're going to take it one step further, right? If we we're going to answer that question, that how's it working out for you question, and we would say, I'm worn out. If we were going to take it one step further, I think something we would say is, I really would like to ride shotgun for a little while. I wouldn't mind it if someone else took over, if someone else drove for a little while and just let me rest. I need a break. Is there anybody out there that can offer me a break? And the answer is yes. This is what this new way of living is all about. It's letting go of the wheel, right? It's sliding over and letting the Holy Spirit drive. And here's the deal. I know that this might have been pretty easy for Carrie Underwood, right, to do this. Jesus, take the wheel. But here's here's the thing. For some of us right now in life, it's really hard. And I don't want to stand here today and I don't want to preach today and make it sound like it's easy to give up control of your life. Or to say that I'm going to let something or someone else lead me and guide me every step of the way. Because giving up control in our culture and our society is so counterintuitive and it goes against our nature, right? It it kind of makes these defense mechanisms come out in us. It's like when someone talks about taking control away from us, fight or flight kicks in. And either we want to run or we want to bow up and square up and say, you're not taking this away from me. So how do we do this? See, Paul, he goes on in in Romans 8, he says this in verse 12, he says, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you've got no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You're no longer in control under that control. For you, if you live by what it dictates, 
by, by what it orders, by what it commands, by the way it wants to control you. If you live by that sinful nature, the old way of life, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. And here's the kicker. For all who are led by, which means surrender to. It means that that we look at the Holy Spirit and, and we say, you lead. You drive. You take over. You take the wheel. We're surrendering. We're letting go of the wheel and letting you take the lead in our lives. For all of those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are children of God. See, if grace is the heart of where our spiritual life comes from, then the Spirit is the power that makes it go. See, just like our hearts are are powered by these electrical impulses from our brains and those electrical impulses make the muscles in our heart squeeze and contract. See, grace, the, 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 the life that comes from grace is powered by the Holy Spirit in the same way. It's what makes the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is what makes grace go. See, in the Old Testament, there was this word they used for the Holy Spirit. It's the word ruah. See, the Old Testament was written in this language called Hebrew. And in the Hebrew language, the word for Holy Spirit was ruah, which means presence, the presence of God. In the New Testament, the word is pneuma or pneumas. And it's the same word that we use to get like pneumonia or pneumatic from, you know, things that are air powered or things that have to do with breath. Because this word for spirit in the New Testament, it, it means this breath, air wind, right? That's what, when we think about the Holy Spirit, that's what we think about. That's what it's compared to. Brendan Manning, who I love, you know, when he's asked about the Holy Spirit, he, he makes the comparison to the wind. And any of my 90s kids that listen to uh, DC Talk's Jesus Freak album, you're going to know what I'm talking about because he says, and this is, this is a quote that's on this album, he says, you know, I can see the wind, or I can't see the wind rather, but I can see the effects of the wind. So when I look outside and the wind's blowing, I, I can't see it. I can't see where the wind is going. I can't see, I can't see, physically see the wind, but here's what I can do. I can see its effects. I can see the trees move. I can see the grass move. I can feel its effects on my body. And so it's the same way with the Holy Spirit, who is 100% God. See, it's not like when it comes to like the power thing, like God gets the gold and Jesus gets the silver and the Spirit gets the bronze. No, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is 100% God. And when we choose grace, right, when we accept it, when we step into this new way of living, the Spirit, the presence, the breath of God lives here at the very core of who we are. Our DNA and the very DNA of God become fused together. And like Paul says in verse 14, we are now children of God. Because just like our own kids, right? If you've got kids, part of us lives in our kids. Some of us, our kids look just like us. You know, people will say, man, it's just like looking into a mirror. They say that about me and my youngest son, Cash. It's like looking into a mirror. It's crazy. Part of us lives in our kids. Part of God now as a result of the Holy Spirit lives in us. And here's the thing, it's not a dictatorship. God doesn't live in us to to rule and reign over us. He lives in us to start this intimate relationship with us where God is literally closer to us than our skin. And he wants to lead us and he wants to guide us into this new way of living. See, Paul says this in Romans 8 verse 15. He says, you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. See, now we call him Abba Father. That word Abba is daddy. It's the same word for for father that a little kid would call their dad. It's daddy. We call him Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's kids. See, this new way of living, it's all about surrender. It says, I'm done trying to drive this life thing. God, I'm going to let you drive. I'm going to let your spirit take over. I'll go where you want to take us. I'll live the way you want me to live. I'll become who you desire for me to become. Every step of the way, the Holy Spirit is there to keep us on that path. And here's the deal. I'm going to be straight with you when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Because some people will ask me, like, like, what's it like to hear from the Holy Spirit? Or have you ever heard from God? 
going to be real. I, I have never had a moment where the skies have opened up and beams of light have rained down and I've heard this voice from heaven say, Brad, this is what I want you to do. It's never happened to me. In fact, if you read scripture, you can count the number of people this happened to really on one hand. But here's what I have experienced. You know, when I read a story out of the Bible, and maybe it's a story that I've read hundreds of times before, and I know where it's going and I know what it says, but yet even in a story that's familiar, something new hops off the page and begins to affect my life. Or maybe it's when I'm listening to a song and a lyric or a chorus catches me and I feel it right here. It speaks to me in that moment. Or maybe it's when I'm scrolling through my phone and I see a name and there's just this undeniable feeling to, to call this person. Hey, this is the person you need to call. Or maybe it's when I'm in a conversation with someone and I get this nudge and, and I know that in this conversation, this is the one thing that needs to be said. And maybe it's not an easy thing to say. Maybe it's not an easy conversation to have, but I know I know this is what needs to be said. I know I need to ask this question. I know I need to say these things. And in that moment, we have a choice. We can, in that moment, ignore the Holy Spirit. We can grab the wheel and say, dear God, no, amen, and turn the way that we want to go. Or we can let go. We can trust him and we can let him lead in the direction that he wants to take us. So here's my question for you today as we wrap up. What's standing between you and a new way of living your life? What's standing between you and surrender, right? This new life that's lived by letting go. What if, what if this week, in any given situation, you ask the Holy Spirit, even if it's just you're around your table teaching your kids, all of a sudden you went from, from being someone that works in an office or being someone that, that does one thing or another, and now you're a homeschool parent, right? What if, what if even in a moment like that, you ask the Holy Spirit, hey, what do you want for me now? Hey, what do you want to do with me now? Is there something you want me to say? Is there someone you want me to call? Is there something you want for me is there something you want me to do? What, what if your attitude was this? I'm yours. I'm, I'm listening. And you have my yes. Whatever it is you ask me to do, you have my yes. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure if I can do that. Some of you might right now go, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sure that I know that I can trust the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure he's going to make me do something crazy. I don't know. How, how do I know I can trust him? See, Paul closes out this chapter of Romans this way. And this, to me, is how we can trust him. Starting in verse 35, he says, can, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? I mean, does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or if we're persecuted, if we're hungry, if we're destitute, if we're in danger, or if we're threatened with death? Basically, it's like, is God's love conditional? Is it based on situation and circumstance? Meaning that if I'm going through something rough right now, that means God doesn't love me? No. Despite all of these things, Paul says, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And then I love these verses. It says, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. Not a quarantine, not a virus, not fear. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. If that's not worth trusting, I don't know what is. He's worth our trust. We can trust him with our lives. We can slide over to the passenger seat and let God hop in the driver's seat and, and let him lead and let him take us and let his Holy Spirit guide us and speak to us and remind us of just how much he loves us. And here's the deal. I know that this is difficult. I know that it's difficult to even imagine giving up control because some of us right now, we feel like we've already done that. 
We feel like that right now maybe our lives are being controlled by whatever announcement comes from the news or the TV or, or our state and local governments. Or, or we feel like maybe because something is going on in, in our kids' lives, you know, these sweet little kids that used to be this tall and nice and loved us have grown up. And now there's like some alien high school kid living in my, my upstairs bedroom where my kid used to be. And, and there's, there are times in our lives where it feels like everything is out of control. And so the things that we want to control, we grab a hold of and we hang on to them tight. I'm not telling you this is easy, but I am telling you that it's worth it. And if you're tired today, if you're worn out today, if you just get to a point where you go, you know what? Would someone else just drive this train? That's when God says, yeah, I will. And if you want to step into a new life, into a new way of living, that's what it looks like. Hey, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do with me today? What do you want to do today? What do you want me to say in this moment? Who do you want me to talk to in this moment? How can I be the hands, the feet, the voice of of my heavenly father? How can I say the things to my kids or the people in my life that that God would want to say to them today? You have my yes. If you give me the words, I'll say them. So today, as we uh, kind of end this time and get ready to worship again, I just want to say right where, right where you are in your living room, if you want to make a decision to trust Jesus today, maybe you've never made that decision before in your life and you want to make a decision to trust Jesus today, you can do that. All it is is a personal conversation with Jesus that says, Jesus, I love you and I trust you. Will you be in charge of my life? I take my life and I surrender it. I give it to you. And Jesus' answer to that question is, will you, be, will you be the Lord of my life? He says, yes. Jesus, can I trust you with my life? Yes. You can have that conversation today. You can begin to live in this new way of living today. You don't have to wait. You can do this today. Why? Because there's nothing that separates you from the love of God. Not your past, not your present, not your future, Nothing. So if you want to make that decision today, you can do that. If you need prayer, you can contact us here at church. We would love to pray for you. All you have to do is text prayer ACC to 97000 and we can get those prayer requests in real time. We can respond to those prayer requests. We would love to pray for you. If you want to get connected here at this church or learn more about our church, you can send a text message connect ACC that message again to 97000 and someone on our staff will reach Reach out and make sure that you get connected or that we can answer the questions that you can have. I'm going to pray for us and then the band is going to play and we're going to worship one more time. Jesus, you're good. And Father, this morning, we just say thank you that, that we have the opportunity to step into a new way to live that is partnered and led by not just any old person, but you, your presence, 100% God living within us. And God, I know there's a day that we're gonna, we're gonna meet you face to face and, and I don't know how all this works and, and I look forward to the day you going, hey, this is what it looks like and this is how it worked and this is where I was and this is when I was speaking to you and you remember this moment? Yeah, that was my spirit at work. Father, today I pray that as a church we would give you our yes. Father, that today we would trust you that we would slide over into the passenger seat of our lives and let you take control and let you lead us, not because you're a dictator but because you're a good dad. So, Father, today we give you our lives and we say thanks for sending us your spirit uh, that's made possible through your son, who all of that, God, works together to make this thing called grace. Jesus, we love you. It's name we pray. Amen. The dark tried to hide you and steal you away. Death tried to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you, he tried but he lost. You cannot be stopped. When we cried for freedom, you tore down the walls. The weight of our burdens, you carry it all. Our fears and our failures hang dead on the cross. 
you cannot be stopped mover of mountains breaker of chains Jesus has triumphed over the grave sing hallelujah the battle is won nothing can stand against our God we stand on your victory and shout out your praise miracle maker you're mighty to save awesome in power Relentless in love, you cannot be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing, there's nothing that can stop our God, there's nothing that can stop our God, there's nothing that can stop our God, there is nothing, there is nothing, there's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah. The battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. We just wanted to remind you of our Adventure Christian Church at Home page on our website. Uh, you can get that going to the main website, adventureky.org. Um, this is a really great resource where our children's ministry, our student ministry, um, and our staff have really pulled together to create some unique things for you pushed out each week. This week, you'll want to make sure that you check out the daily devotions posted by our children's ministry. They're short little devotions, um, read, and then um, also some video clips that you can watch with your kids. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Brad is doing a short little devotion that's also pushed out um, on the website. And Tuesday and Thursday, Matt will be leading us in a time of worship. Next Sunday, we'll also be airing another service. Um, so make sure that you check out that page for lots of great resources this week. We also wanted to give you an update on our D groups. We are continuing to work on creative solutions to being able to continue meeting um, with our groups. So if you are in a D group, we would encourage you to reach out to that leader to see kind of what your group is gonna continue to do in these next couple of weeks. 
uh, they will be excited to hear from you and you guys can work on a plan together for your specific group. Don't forget about your Give 10. If you still have your $10 at home, um, use that this week uh, supporting a local business and the new challenge of call 10. Don't forget to find 10 people in your life, give them a call, check on them. Last thing, each week we, uh, through our social media platforms, we are highlighting a local area business. And last week it was Feast. This week, stay tuned to see what it is, but we would encourage you to go uh, support our local businesses. Thanks.